and the snow. How about pumpkins? Yellow. What color are pumpkins? Orange, right. How about flowers? Yes. Pink, what colors are flowers? Red. All colors, aren't they? How about the rainbow? rainbow? All of the colors. God made all of the colors in the sky when we see a rainbow. Well, let's see if we put the colors in the book. Did we put the colors in the book? We did. I know. I want to see if you could blow the colors away. Blow real hard. Once more. Okay, let's see if you blew them away. You blew too hard. You blew everything away. Oh, how did you do that? Now I'm going to have to buy a new coloring book for the next time I do this trick. <laughs> God made lots of colors, even on our skin. We have, right, right. We have some people that are, have real white skin. We have some that have black skin, brown, yellow, all the colors God made. But inside, we're all the same. If you look at a flower, inside of a flower, it's the same. But God made beautiful colors of all of nature and of all of the children and of all of the people. Let's have a prayer and thank God for colors. God, we thank you for the colors that you've made. We thank you for each other and for the love that you have for us. Today, let us look at all the colors and see how beautiful they are and thank you. Amen. So when you go home today, how about color me a picture and bring it next week, okay? Okay. Okay, thank you.
Thank you so much, Micah, Amber Lee, and the choir. Beautiful song. Wish I was talented like that. <laughs> if you would, join me in reading scripture lesson for today. Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 20 and 26 to 28. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. While they were eating, Jesus told some took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body and when he had taken a cup and given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins turn over with to first corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 to 8 Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Would you stand and greet one another? Good morning. You know, I, I don't like, to, uh, can you hear me? Is that, yeah, okay. I don't like to brag. Yeah, I do. Um, so, you know, I went away on the Gospel Nights, uh, our, our six-month planning retreat. We've got six more months of uh, sermons series planned out from January through uh, June. Um, it is, it's incredibly gratifying with that group um, who don't like anything I say. Um, <laughs> to come back, and, and we've been talking about this series, the prequel of Exodus, and I, like I said, this was my, this is the one I had to fight for, because they all thought of it, well, what's the point, why would we do that? And all of them are like, oh, this is like the greatest series we've done. Now, I can't say that it's been great here, I can't speak to that, but for them, their response is, this is the best series we preached. It's my idea. <laughs> anyway, whatever, you, you don't care. You, okay, so anyway, uh, we are we're wrapping up the, uh, the exciting conclusion of this series we've been calling Prequel to Exodus. Um, each week we've looked at, at really just the first 12 or 13 chapters of Exodus, which is, you know, it's less than a third of the book of Exodus, and yet uh, there's just so much there. Uh, remember we focused on Moses the prophet on the first week, and then Bill preached on the plight of the Israelites as they were enslaved in Egypt, and uh, last week we spent uh, a good deal of time on the those nine first nine plagues, and so today we're going to be looking at the Passover, and so that story goes like this: It was the morning after the ninth plague, and this is where we left off last last week. With the uh, remember the darkness of the ninth plague had it was an oppressive darkness and had been over all of Egypt, and finally uh, Pharaoh called Moses in, and they, around and around they go. This, this relationship between Moses and Pharaoh over these nine plagues has been in, intensifying, and um, it really ends with this ninth plague. He, he still says, let my people go. Pharaoh still says, no, I can't do it, and he loses his temper. And he says, get out of my face. I never want to see your face again, or you will die. And Moses says, fine, that's how I want it too. You'll never see my face again. And as he's walking out, he says, oh, but wait a minute. The Lord wants me to tell you there is one more plague coming, and it'll be here right around midnight. 
the Lord himself will pass through all of Egypt and will strike down the firstborn of every Egyptian in all of Egypt. And he walks out, leaving Pharaoh to think, uh, can this be real? Does he mean that? First, firstborn of everyone in Egypt, from, from me all the way down to, to uh, the, the lowest servant? I... Now, what was happening here through those first nine plagues, remember, it, we kind of started off, there was a fair amount of, um, well, what we would, we would call racism now, I guess, but it was more of an ethnic thing. Uh, the Egyptians looked down on the Israelites, but as these nine plagues progressed, the hearts of the Egyptians began to change. They began to soften. And part of it is just they, they started to become believers as they see these plagues happening, and they know that Moses is bringing the Word of God, and every time Moses brings the Word of God, another plague comes. And so by the ninth time, they're all, they've all become believers, but as often happens in these kind of oppressive, abusive situations, it's not that they were just afraid of this God of Moses and the God of the Israelites, but they had also become like really compassionate toward the Israelites. As the, as the Pharaoh continued to increase the abuses, their hearts kind of opened up and they began to care more for the Israelites. And so by the end, the, the Israelites, God, God sends the Israelites to go to the Egyptians and ask them for their gold and silver and clothing. So, so the Israelites go to their, their masters or their neighbors who happen to be Egyptians in the area, and they just say, do you have any gold or silver we could have or maybe some extra clothes, maybe some, some of your good clothes? Because they're about to leave Egypt and they're going to need all of this as they enter the promised land. So the, the Egyptians are like, sure, sure, here, wh yeah, what, whatever else can I give you? Here, I've got this, and they're, they're handing them all of this gold and silver, and off they go with it. Well, as Moses left the palace, it was the morning of that, that final day, and there was a lot of work to be done. There was a long way to go and a short time to get there. And so he gathered all of the leaders of, of Israel together, and he gave them these instructions. He said, okay, we, time is short. We don't have a lot of time. What you need to do is, it, because they would tell the, he would tell the leaders and then they would tell everybody. You know how word spreads fast, right? He said, every family in all of, of all of Israel must get, take their best lamb, their best male lamb, and slaughter it. And as the blood's draining out, collect some of the blood. And take some of that blood and, in a bowl and with a branch of hyssop, Dip it in the bowl and swipe it on the, on the doorpost and the lentil of the door of your house. We're going to have a feast tonight here in Goshen and all over Israel. Every household, every Israelite household must gather together and you've got to eat the entire lamb. So if your family isn't big enough, gather together with your neighbors or your friends or your larger family because you have to eat the entire thing. There's not time to let the dough rise. Just mix up some dough flatten it out, cook it, no, no rising bread. It needs to be the flat bread of unleavened, we call it unleavened bread. There's just no time. It's a controlled hurry. You've got all day to slaughter the lamb and cook it and, uh, and prepare the bread and prepare the feast and take, take the bitter herbs and season the, the lamb. You don't have to eat it raw. Don't eat it boiled. You have time to roast it, but we're in a hurry. So, this is what I do for you. I, I, I YouTube things when I'm curious. Uh, it, you can YouTube uh, like roasting a lamb because I was like, what is roasting? I wasn't even sure what, ro you know, like that's over a fire. So I wrote, I, I, I YouTubed roasting a lamb and I watched, I mean, I was fascinated. This, uh, he's a, this Russian beefcake. I mean, like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's just a YouTube video, but he's got a million and a half, I mean, this, this massive, Russian guy, and he's got his little daughter running around. He goes from start to finish, he roasts this lamb, and he's seasoning it, and he does it, what appears to be exactly what God is prescribing to do for the Passover. And he, put his, he puts it in this, on this steak, and, and the lamb is like spread out on the, on the stick. It's like this cross-like spit, and he leans it over the fire, and he, he rotates it every now and then, and he, he takes some, some herbs, it looks like rosemary, and he's swiping it on it to season it. it I mean, it's a fascinating, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, you, like, you should just watch it. It's fascinating to watch. He wasn't in a hurry, but it takes all day. And by evening, the lamb was ready eat, to eat. They had, they had prepared whatever meal that they could, and they gathered into their houses, 
Large families got together. Small families got together with each other. They swiped the blood on the doorposts, and they shut the door. And God says, don't go outside. No one goes outside. And as you eat this meal, eat it hurriedly. Do you ever eat fast? Like, you know, right? I can eat fast. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Eat it fast with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand, as if you're ready to go. Because when the time comes to leave, we have to be ready to go. Have you ever been waiting for somebody to pick you up? You got your coat on, your purse, right? Shoes are tied. You're sitting in the formal living room because well, I'm not even going to walk around in my, in my shoes. So I just I have to sit here and I'm looking out the door waiting for them to arrive. Ever been like that, right? We all have. That's what they were. As they ate, the, the men with their staffs, anybody who has a walking staff, their sand, you're not allowed to wear your shoes in, in Middle Eastern culture. That's unusual to wear your shoes in the house. But they've got their shoes on. They're eating fast. They're ready to go. And no one, no one goes outside. And God says, because the blood on the doorpost and on the lentil will be a sign. And when I, when I go through Egypt and strike down the firstborn of everyone in Egypt, I will see the blood on the doorpost and it will be a sign to me and I will pass over you to the next house. Well, sure enough, that night the angel of the Lord passes through Egypt and struck down the firstborn of every Egyptian in every household, from, from the pharaoh all the way down to the lowest prisoner. Every firstborn in every family, every livestock that was the firstborn died that night. Now, I'm not sure, because you, I mean, you're probably calculating like me, okay, in my, fa- in my house, uh, what's just, what's Zach and Grace? They're dead. In my family's house, in my parents' house, if it was then, it would just be Julie. <laughs> not as bad, right, you? Because <laughs> she's watching right now. She's like, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> right? Like, and so I'm not sure if it's any firstborn died or if it was just in the households, the firstborn in that household, which is kind of different, right? Because in our household, Grace, would, she'd live if it was that way. But I think it's just the first one. Either way, you're looking at a 20% death rate, probably, give or take. That night, the angel of the Lord passed through and struck down the firstborn of everyone everyone in Egypt. And throughout Egypt, and you can imagine eating that meal late into the night, throughout all of Egypt, you can hear these cries and wails. You can imagine. Every house, all of your neighbors, in every house, someone is dead. Everyone is screaming. Everyone is crying. It is a mess. And so the morning, early morning comes. Pharaoh's aware of what happened, and he calls his officials together, and, you know, everyone, everyone is tear-streaked, and everyone is mourning. And he says, well, what do we do? Well, I, I don't know what else to do. And they say, you've got to let him go. He's been asking all along to let them go so that they can go worship their God. Let them go. We don't need them here. Just let them go. And so... Pharaoh calls Moses, and remember, he said he wasn't going to see him anymore. He calls him in one last time. He says, rise up. Go away from my people, you and all the Israelites. Go and worship the Lord as you have said. Take your your flocks, your herds, your children, everything, and be gone. And go worship your Lord. Now, of course, I'm thinking to myself, all he's been asking all along is I need to go with everyone into the wilderness so we can have a festival to worship our God. And he doesn't say we're not coming back. It's just this request. Well, here they are. They stayed in the land of of Egypt, and they had their festival anyway, didn't they? They still had that meal. And in that meal, the result was it killed the firstborn of every, every Egyptian. And so... The last thing he says to him, which is an interesting thing. Remember earlier last week I said it was weird. He said, pray for me. He says, the Pharaoh says that to Moses, and now he says again, and please ask a blessing for me. What an odd thing to ask of Moses as you're throwing them out of Egypt. Pray for me again, will you? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll pray for you. Well, it wasn't just Moses and, and Pharaoh who had this conversation. Throughout all of Egypt, 
all of the Egyptians everywhere who are mourning and distraught, they go to the Israelites and they say, you've got to go. Pack up your stuff and get out of here. Everyone, please, we can't survive another night like this. We will all be dead. Please, you have to go. You have to go. And so the Egyptians hustle them out. Have you ever, anybody here ever moved to a new house? How long does it take to pack up? <laughs> I mean, I remember the last time I moved was, was to here, and it took us a full six months of every day packing a little bit and getting rid of stuff. You know, like, they packed in a day. They knew 24 hours ago, we're leaving tomorrow. What do you take? What do you leave behind? The Bible says, so the Israelites, they took the last, they, they made a lump of dough out of the flour they had left. They threw it in their kneading bowls, wrapped it up in their cloaks, threw it over the shoulders, and off they went. The clothes on their back the staffs in their hands, the sandals on their feet, their loins girded, and off they went. Not much to take with you, right? I mean, I'm assuming they grabbed, what, it's, but it's really what you can carry. There's no time to grab a moving chariot, moving cart. So as they begin to exit Egypt, and they're headed, they're headed due south, and as they, as they, you know, because they're coming from all over, and they're, they're coalescing, and they're, they're moving in this force of, uh, it's a million, a million point two. It's, it's a lot of people headed south, and they just, they're, they're gathering, and, and as they're headed south, the, the Bible says they stopped at Sukkoth. And I always thought that was a, that was a, that's a why'd they stop there? Did they catch their breath to assemble? No. In Sukkoth, there were, more men who had been made slaves, Israelite men who were slaves, mining in the copper and the turquoise mines. They stopped to get the other men who were slaves and being forced into labor all the way in the south. Interesting, right? And so by the time they left Succoth, they've got 600,000 marching men armed for war. Whatever that means, right? Because I doubt they all have swords, but they've got clubs and rocks and sticks and whatever it is. But 600,000 men, plus all the women and kids, headed south, I, I mean, that is a massive army in the, old, in the ancient days. It's still a large army now, but back then, there were, just weren't that many people in the world. And they continue to march south, and ahead of them is the pillar of fire. It's, it's, it was by, by day, it was actually a pillar of cloud. You couldn't see the fire, but when the sun went down and it got dark, it was a pillar of fire. And it lit up the night like a nightlight, and it just, it headed in a straight path to the south, and they followed it. And I, the way you get the sense, it's 120 miles they're going, and they, like, you can move about 20 miles a day at best by foot. So I, I envision there's just this constant moving south. Like people will stop and they rest because it's a couple days. This is a week-long journey at least. As they're headed south, they just stop, they camp a little bit, up they go, the next group stops, they build their fire on the same fire that was built there, and they're just moving in this wave of undulating humans south 120 miles. And they're following this cloud day in and day out. Moses grabbed the bones of Joseph, in case you were worried. Joseph had said before he died, that's back in Genesis, that's the prequel to the prequel, Make sure you take my bones out of here, okay? It's going to be fine to live here for a while, but when you go to the promised land, take my bones with you. So, so Moses got that bag also with his bones. And they headed south. It's interesting because if you know, the, if you know your atlas at all, this is Egypt. The, the Red Sea is here. The promised land is over here. But they're headed this way. Why aren't they headed due east? Because God didn't want to take them through the land of the Phil Philistines where they would most likely end up in a battle because he was afraid they'd lose their nerve and run back to Egypt and back to slavery. So he takes them south in this roundabout way. And they get all the way down to what, what would be like the, the lower part of the Red Sea into a place called Migdal. And they're gathering around the Red Sea. And of course, they're looking out and they're like, well, where, where do we go now? Well, don't worry about it. It's, you know, like they're not, it's not long because in the meantime, Pharaoh and his officials have come to their senses, I guess. They, uh, 
The mourning period has ended. They've buried their dead. It's been a few days, and they say to themselves, what have we done? What have we done? We've, we've run our workforce out of here, and now, now we've lost 20, 20% of our people. What, what, we can't let them go. We need them back for our economy to make things work. Who will make things run for us? Who will build things for us? We have to go get them. So Pharaoh orders his chariot army, his chariot army, because they move fast, the whole chariot army, all to head south. And so they pursue the Israelites headlong, same down, down I mean, it's easy to follow the path, right? Like, it's like locusts went through, right? Like just every, just a, a, a path is beaten into the ground. And they are full force headed south to Migdal. And you can imagine this moment where the first person turns around and looks and sees cresting the horizon a massive line of chariots barreling toward you. Can you imagine? They're like, what have we done? And, and the panic spreads. It spreads and it spreads fast. They've been willing to follow Moses up to this point. They've become rudimentary believers in the one true God who they up until this now didn't, didn't up until now didn't really barely even knew him and and now they're out here in the wilderness and <coughs> the Egyptians have changed their minds as we knew they would and they go to Moses and they say were there no gra- graves in Egypt for us to just die there that you brought us out here in the wilderness to die we told you we told you back in Egypt we didn't want to go leave us alone and let us be slaves in Egypt because it's better to serve the Egyptians than to die out here in the wilderness. I mean, they're furious, and they're panicked, and their eyes are wide, and they're, they're shaking. And Moses, Moses looks at them and says, what? Don't be afraid. Stand firm, because the Lord will fight for you today, and you will never see these Egyptians again. Stand firm. Stand firm, I tell you. And he's trying to pass that courage on to them. But I'm not sure he feels it as much as I want him to. He goes in and begins to pray to God. Private spot, begins to pray to God. And God says this. Why are you crying to me? He says, why are you crying out to me? Why are you crying to me? Tell the Israelites to move forward into the water. Tell the Israelites to move forward. But you, you go set, you you lift up your staff and you stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so that the Israelites can go across on dry ground. So he lifts the staff and he puts his hand out over the sea and a wind begins to blow right over him into this pinpoint spot in the Red Sea and, it, and the wind is so fast and so hard that it begins to push the water to the side. What a week to talk about wind and water and waves, right? I mean, they were, the, the, the speeds in, the, in Hurricane Ian were up to 100 miles an hour or so, right? It must have been faster. But even that, we've seen the images of what the destructive force of waves and wind can do, right? I mean, these boats that are just piled up, this seven-foot wave that just crushed everything along, you know, even, it was just a seven-foot wave. And it has that kind of crushing power. The wind is blowing and blowing, and it, it, it parts the waters, but it keeps blowing, and this just, well, remember, there was several years ago, did you all have the derecho, I think it was called a derecho, it, it blew through, did it blow through here too? I see some nods. It, we were still in, in Southern Maryland when it happened. It was like, we, I went out and stood in it. It, was, it sounded like a train was rolling through, and it was in just one direction, and it was constant for like 10 minutes or something. It's fascinating. I got dirt in my eyes. I had to go back inside. That's what's happening here. Is something, I guess, something like that. And finally, the, the ground is dry, and there's this, this path in the sea, and, and Moses is like, forward, because the Egyptians haven't stopped just because the wind started blowing. The only thing that's happened is the flame, the, the tower of fire, the pillar of fire went around to the back, and it just blocked them so that they couldn't, could only go so far, just far enough. We're not just far enough. And so as they head through, and the, there's a million people headed through this pathway in the sea, and they get up there, some of them are getting up there, and they're spreading out on the other side. And they're like, what do we do, though? What do we do? 
The Egyptians can't help themselves. They just, they're so stubborn. Because you've got to be thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Chariot or not, I'm not sure I want to go down in there. As they head into the sea, it's, you know, it starts off, it's just, you know, it's just a foot on the shore. It's just, and then it just, there's this wall of, of waves. Who's brave enough to do that? Well, the Israelites were. But they don't even stop. They just go, go. And so the whole army's headed in, into this wall of water. And the last Israelite gets up on the other side. And they turn around, and Moses is standing there. And he raises up his staff, and he holds up his hand. And as he's doing that, the Bible says that the Lord looked at the Egyptian army. It looked at them. Like God, it, like he's been watching the Israelites and all of a sudden he looks back and there's this oppression as he looks at them. It, it throws the horses into panic. They feel, they can feel the pressure of God looking on them. And as God is looking on them, the pressure of God looking on them, the water begins to seep back in to, to the dry ground. It's begin, like his, God's pressure, I think, is, and so the, the chariot wheels begin to clog and they're terrified and they're, they panic now. They're now all the way in, the, in there, and they said, we got to go. The Lord is fighting for them. I mean, now, now you figured it out. They're turning around, and it doesn't matter because it's too late because Moses has, has given them this, and the waves crash in on the, on the Egyptians. Kills them all. I mean, again, the destructive force of waves. I mean, we, we, you, you see these images of boats that have, have ended up in neighborhoods. How did that get there? I mean, the, you just can't withstand that kind of the weight of the water as it just crashes in and creates this huge, just, it would just rip us all apart. And that's what it does to the Israelite army, the Egyptian army. Can you imagine the moment on the other side as the Israelites watched this happen? The horror, the awe, the, the, fe- the fear of, of, of what they did, like of all of it. And they begin to, they begin to, to shout and, and cheer and cry. And Miriam's, his, Moses' sister, sings a song. And, and then they turn their backs and they head into the wilderness. For 40 years, they travel through this wilderness on their way up to the promised land. But it takes them 40 years to get there. What should have been just a couple of weeks ends up being 40 years. And that's the story for another day, folks. <laughs> that's how we end. The Egyptian army has been tossed into the sea. So, and most of this came from Exodus 12 and 13, every, most of everything I said today. Uh, it was written down much later, and so it's a very formalized version of it. And so, the, you know, it has clear instructions, and it's written out. And some of that stuff I kept out because I'm almost sure that it wasn't like that the first time. But over those years... The language becomes formalized. The instructions become formalized. The traditions become formal. You know how traditions start, right? Like one year you do it, and you liked it. And so the next year you do it again, and pretty soon you've got a tradition. We have all kinds of traditions in our families, and they're so fun. You look forward to this thing, and sometimes it's just a little thing. Sometimes it's a huge thing. The recipe's formalized. Does anybody not cook the same meal every year at Thanksgiving and Christmas? It's the same thing. Mom doesn't make those those, uh, those stuffing balls, those Koreans are going to miss it. I can promise you they're going to be like, because it's like catnip for those Koreans. <laughs> for those watching online, my wife's Korean. I feel like i got to explain that, right? But they, they go crazy for it. Like it's the, I don't know, it's the sage or something. I don't, I don't, I don't, they love it. <laughs> like if you don't do that, you're going to hear about it. Mimi and Moji are going to be like, where's the, where's the stuffing balls? <laughs> all, all of those traditions solidify and a thousand years goes by a thousand years and every year at this time they celebrate the Passover meal every year same thing and they pass down the story because a story like that it doesn't come from nowhere every year you would tell that story on that day Every year you would share with your kids because some of them were born that year and some of them were just babies and so now they're beginning to understand. They're like, and there was a wave and the angel of death. You tell the story over and over again. 1,500 years goes by. 
And it's become a, what God calls a perpetual ordinance, which means forever, a law forever. Every year, they celebrate this Passover meal. We do it every year, right? We call it the Seder meal. We do our best to recreate this one. We, we don't we don't do what, what the Jews today do because they've got a lot more traditions that have been added on. We try to take what's in the Bible and recreate it for ourselves. And, it, and well, we've been doing it for 10 years. And now it's become tradition for us. I've been doing it for 30 years. It becomes this thing that you look forward to. It would have been 1,500 years since the actual time it happened. It's now, we, we call it 30 AD, or if, if you prefer, year 30 of the Common Era. It's been about 30 years, though, into the, this new life of Jesus. And he gathers, as, as we always do, he gathers his friends and his family together, his disciples, and some of his family members are even there at this point. And they gather for this meal, and it's in an, it's in an upper room, and it's a large room. It's a lot of people, because it takes a lot of people to eat a full-size lamb. And they share in this meal. And there it is, the unleavened bread. And there it is, this, this, these cups of wine that over the time have become a part of the tradition that we drink, we drink four cups of wine every, every time. And, and each time Jesus breaks the bread and he gives it to them, and each time he lifts the cup and he gives it to them, he says more stuff that changes the tradition. It changes the meaning of it for, for everyone, for all time. You know, of all the of all the stories in the, in the Bible, it, the book of Exodus has the most symbolism, the most metaphor. When you read the book of Exodus, it, it is our story. It is the story of the Israelites and their journey to faith, their journey to salvation and freedom from slavery and into freedom and into the promised land. And overlay, you can overlay our spiritual journey on top of it. Their time in, in, in slavery is our time, enslaved to sin, before we know Christ, before we barely maybe have heard of God, and, and this, things happen, and, and, and it affects us, and eventually, you and I come to a place where we say, I believe in this. I believe. I believe. And it becomes this statement. That's, that's their, mo- their moment where, they, where they've, they've, they've been pursued, because it's pursuing. Our sin pursues us out of the slavery and into the into the the crossing the red sea that's our salvation moment if we have a salvation moment that's our when we cross the red sea it is that moment where we say yes lord i believe i believe because at that moment the waters wash away our sin they wash away the sin and it can't pursue you anymore the only way it can pursue you is if you turn back and go back into it because you've been set free you've been saved by by this lamb, the blood of this lamb that cleanses your hearts. I mean, there's just, again, like you can get caught up in just mixing metaphors, but there's just so much. The, the flame that, that leads us is the Holy Spirit, and the wind that blows is the Holy Spirit that creates a path and leads us into freedom. And then as the Israelites spend their 40 years in the wilderness wandering, but they're not wandering. God is leading them through. And as God leads them through, two things happen to these Israelites. The hardships and the challenges of living in the wilderness strengthen them. They become, they were already pretty strong. They were, they they had been working in hard labor as slaves, but now there's a strengthening that comes from within. But more importantly, what they learn over 40 years is to believe in God. They learn to trust in God because literally every day their daily bread is provided by God. Water is provided by God. Their direction, everything, their very lives are provided for by God. That's our, that's our journey of faith. After we find Christ and we say, yes, Lord, I will. Yeah, me too. Count me in. Whatever version, you say the sinner's prayer. Whatever version that is, the, the rest of your life is journeying in the wilderness, strengthened and learning to live on the bread of God, the daily bread, the daily sustenance, the daily leading. This is our lives. This is our whole lives until it ends and we die and once again we cross over the water into the promised land which is the eternal life with Christ it's a beautiful story and when you read Exodus it is our story 
our failings, our weaknesses, our, our, the times when we want to turn back and go back into the slavery, and, and all of those times where we believe and we do the right thing and we follow Christ and we trust in Christ, we trust in God to, d- to deliver us and to, to take us into freedom and t- to strengthen us. And all of that is brought together in this, this holy meal. The past meets the present meets the future as Jesus gathers around a table that's probably a floor actually they're probably on the floor as they gathered around and they broke bread together Jesus took the bread and he gave it to them and said this is my body broken for you given for you I will be the lamb and will sacrifice myself for you And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, my blood of the new, this new covenant. From here on, a perpetual ordinance poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins so that we might be one bread and one body and one blood together, joined together, holding hands as we join in Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So um, it's, been, it's been a few months since we celebrated uh, here in the sanctuary, and if we're honest with ourselves, it's been very few times since this is still a new building to us. Uh, just a reminder of how we'll do communion. We'll have two stations, uh, one right about here and one right about here. Uh, the ushers will come up and, and help me distribute. So what we'll do is these, yeah, these two rows will come in and circle out. So come in. Take the bread, take the, the cup. Yeah, cups and bread. And then circle back up to your seats. Same goes over here in this way. And are we, are we starting from the rear, guys? Okay. I mean, I'm still figuring it out too, right? Like, we, we haven't had a century of tr- tradition. We're still figuring it out. All right, so in and out. And uh, let's, uh, if I can have my communion helpers come up.
protect you the Lord. Lift up your hearts unto the perfect right like the, the first Passover wasn't perfect either and uh, we're still figuring out our traditions um, I want to invite uh, Donna Weimer to come up and get, just give us a quick rundown the, the women's retreat was this weekend and I didn't know you guys are back already so they're back and so Donna's going to give a quick quick rundown of, of your retreat thank you Pastor Mike yes uh, 14 women left here Friday at 1 o'clock and we had a whirlwind trip to the Fresh Grounded Faith uh, Conference, Women's Conference in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. We were able to praise God and fill our cups with over 700 women. And um, 700 women in one room praising God is uh, an experience that everyone should have. Um, I really would like to um, thank the two people who were responsible for getting us signed up and getting us there, and those two people are Stephanie Mole and Melinda Malott, and because of them, we were able to do it. If you have not heard um, of the Bible teachings of Jennifer Rothschild, you need to look her up. If you have not heard the music of Laura Story or Michael O'Brien, you need to look them up. We were 30 minutes from Lancaster, so of course we had to make a stop there at Sight and Sound and help filled our cup even further with the story of David. So we returned uh, yesterday evening about 10 o'clock and it was um, an unforgettable experience. And I know that many women would have loved to have joined us, maybe didn't really know enough about it, or it just was a busy weekend for you, but next time, I hope that you can join us. Now as we prepare our hearts to give back a portion to the Lord, if the ushers would come, and we'll take our offering. Thank you, Donna and Randy. Uh, some announcements today. We, we do uh, want to continue to lift up uh, the Floridians and the Carolinas and then everyone that's been affected. Uh, this ended up being a pretty serious storm. Um, you know, I was planning to, we were supposed to go to Florida for our retreat and uh, ended, up canc ended up moving it to Virginia because of uh, uh, how bad it, it was supposed to get. Um, if you have donations to give to the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which we call UMCOR, 
Uh, you can, if you already have a donation and you want to put that in the uh, offering plate, just make sure it's clearly marked if it's a check. Um, you can also go online to, you can go to umc.org or just, um, just Google UMCOR disaster relief and it, it comes right up. And so if you want to make an online donation, this, uh, what's great about the United Methods Committee on Relief is 100% of your donations go to the, to the, the disaster or what, whatever you're donating to, you can specify where it goes and 100% there, there are no overhead costs, no administrative costs. We already pay for all of those with our apportionments every month. And so uh, that's really the beauty of it. And any other um, disaster relief is not going to be able to give that kind of, those kind of numbers to you. So um, you can go online, or if you want to write out a check and put it in the offering plate, that's great. Um, prayers also are, uh, we're taking a fall ASP trip coming up this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We will be, uh, le there will be eight folks going, and um, I found out this week we'll be doing a uh, little bit of finishing up some flooring, vinyl flooring and baseboard and some window trim work as well as uh, finishing a ba bathroom surround. And so those of you that are going, I'll be sending an email with uh, just some final stuff pro probably tomorrow that will end up coming out. And uh, so just a few other announcements. Wednesday morning Bible studies at 10 a.m. will now take place here in the sanctuary. It's just getting a little bit chilly for some of, the fo <laughs> for some of us. Um, out at the pavilion, so uh, we'll, we'll begin to begin to shut the pavilion down now for the winter. Uh, it is also it's soup season again, and the Heart to Table Ministry will be making vegetable beef soup this coming Wednesday, right after Bible study. So finish up with Bible study, and you head into the kitchen and start chopping vegetables. And uh, we're going to be making uh, vegetable beef soup. Our Heart to Table Ministry gives food to our shut-ins and. Folks that are lonely or maybe in need, and so we just try to, all winter if we can, have a selection of, of hams and, and things to, to give to those that are in need. It's just one of our ways that we reach out to, to those that are in need and to just be a presence here in the community for those that, that uh, are lonely or in need. Um, you may have noticed, it is, well, it's October, so it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and, um, you know... I was not aware of how many w women, even in our own congregation, have been affected by, by this. And so, because often I think it is a private thing, but we are doing our best this, this month to, to uh, from, through our women's ministry, to give back and to support breast cancer awareness. And to begin the month, we are going to be handing out in the foyer as you leave today um, pink bracelets that we, we ask if, you, if you're willing to wear them all month to show your solidarity. Um, but we will also next week be having a, a pink out, which means we're, we're hoping to, as many folks as we can will wear pink. Uh, I see some of you have already jumped the gun. Uh, I don't have any pink, so I, I'm going to have to find a pink shirt that uh, really shows off the guns. <laughs> right, Randy? So anyway, pink shirts or pink, wear pink this week um, and all month if you can, if you got that much pink. Um, but after church next week, we will have, I, I'm assuming it's going to be pink cake and pink lemonade. You know, pink cake is usually one of the most delicious cakes of, of the cake family. Um, pink cake and pink lemonade after church next week. And then finally, we will have a tea, um, and you can read all about it in the bulletin. That's going to be coming up on October 22nd, but the RSVP is due today. So yeah, it's there or in your bulletin. Um, but RSVP is due today. If you're planning to attend and support breast cancer awareness, support a survivor or, or memory of, of, of someone, um, really it's kind of open to everyone, but we need those RSVPs back because they really are going to uh, create a, a, a beautiful tea for us on the 22nd. Coming up on, on October 30th, we have Trunk or Treat. You can read about that also in the bulletin. Uh, that will be from 4 to 6 p.m. We have a trunk or treat event out in the parking lot, and we'll be giving out to the community hot dogs and chips and drinks. And what you can do to participate is, well, just, just show up, preferably with a costume. But if you want to bring your car and decorate your trunk or the bed of your truck in some way and give out candy, this is our, our, uh, uh, our addition to the community uh, trick-or-treating that goes on usually on the 31st, but we'll be doing it on Sunday the 30th from 4 to 6 p.m. We also have a fall workday coming up on October 15th, and that will be from 9 to 11.30. You can, again, read about that in the bulletin, but that's a fall workday. We're going to be putting together our soccer goals, hoping to rent the, the soccer fields out in the spring. Um, and again, if you know 
of a soccer organization or another organization that may want to rent our fields, we, uh, we are interested and would love to hear your, hear your contacts or have them reach out to us directly. Um, and finally, we are accepting applications for the Rehoboth Sound Room and Projection Team. That's, uh, there, are, there are three different avenues and they each are specialized. Like they, they don't cro there's not a lot of crossover. Uh, our sound room does the sound room, our projection does projection, and then of course we keep Steve in the closet doing the online uh, version of it. But um, we, we, are, we need volunteers just to create some depth and it's time to start training some folks. And so if you would like to be a part of it, um, you could head back after church and talk to anyone that's back there. It looks like Justin and Jamie are, are back there today, but also if you, you can peek into the closet and say hi to Steve and just let them know you're interested, we'll be doing trainings in the, in the future. All right, I believe we have come to the end of our time together. Let's stand for the doxology. Thanks for joining us today in worship. It's been a good time. Let's join me in prayer, please. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for Passover. Help us to never forget the price and the new beginning that you provided for us. Help us to understand and realize that you continue to lead us out of whatever bondage that we might be in. Father, may we live a life in such a way that others will be drawn to you. And Father, now as we pray, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us take our found freedom in Christ and give it to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.